So, indie horror games, am I right, everyone? In all seriousness, or as much seriousness as this topic can allow, indie horror games have taken the world by storm. In the last few years, there have been countless hits that became viral sensations practically overnight, especially with the influence of YouTube and Twitch gaming becoming much more mainstream than it's ever been before. However, there's one indie horror game that rose above the rest. One game that broke the mold of the more traditional game genre and changed the format forever. A game that was so revolutionary, so unexpected, and so incredibly- It's Five Nights at Freddy's. Y you've seen the title of this video. You knew exactly what I was leading up to. So let's just skip that part and get to the point. In case you've been living under a rock, let me explain the basics of the topic. Five Nights at Freddy's began as a humble indie horror game made by Scott Cawthon as a last ditch effort for his games to succeed online. Not only did FNAF succeed, but it became a worldwide phenomenon on the internet. It was a short game with a simple premise, but it quickly got people hooked, especially when YouTubers began to discover hidden secrets and lore in the game's background details. Ever since that first game, the franchise has grown to a previously unimaginable extent, Hell, the recent game even released on the PlayStation, and a mainstream console release is a pretty big deal for indie games. And to think that all of this started with one little game that came out eight years ago? I remember when Markiplier first played this game, how is it already that old? Existential crisis aside, let's get to the real point of this video. Everybody knows that the FNAF games have become more family friendly now that they're more mainstream. I still feel weird when I see an eight year old kid buying a Freddy plushie at Target or Walmart, but that's just the state of the franchise now. The games aren't scary anymore. In fact, some of the fan made games and projects are scarier than the recent entries of the official series. This isn't very surprising because Five Nights at Freddy's is notorious for the community of fan games and parodies that it created, but that got me thinking. People seem to have a very mixed response to the newest FNAF game, Security Breach. Even if we all ignore the very, very, very obvious glitches and bugs in the game, Freddy! Freddy, you bitch! Freddy! people still seem split about it. Much more split than the community has ever been about other games in the franchise. Some people love the new characters and the free roaming, but others claim that it ruins the horror of the game and takes away the story that the series has been building over the years. What if there was a way we could make everyone happy? What if we could create a game that would satisfy both halves of the fan base? Would we be able to fix the issues that held Security Breach back from being the perfect finale for this series? Well, we definitely can't make a perfect game, but we can try to make something decent. Okay, so if we want to make a game that would satisfy the fan base, we have to look at the games that exist in the series this far. I want to take every game from the official FNAF series to briefly discuss the best parts of each game, and also review which games are considered to be the best or worst entries by the general fan base, along with my own personal opinion just for some spice. First on the chopping block, we have Five Nights at Freddy's. This game is a classic, it's obviously regarded very fondly by the community, and there isn't much to say about it beyond the general foundations of the series. I think the most popular aspect of this game was what would eventually become a trademark of FNAF games and properties, and that's the hidden lore scattered throughout secrets in the game. So let's make that the first ingredient on our little recipe list. Secrets and lore. Five Nights at Freddy's 2. This game is highly regarded by the community, and it's often seen as the best one in the series as well. This is because it perfectly balances a lot of different gameplay elements and features, alongside a cast of memorable, haunting characters. I could rant about why the second game is the best one, but I don't want this to be a super long video, so for now we're just going to say that the large cast was the strength of the game. All of the different mechanics, the balance, and the organized chaos of each night just boils down to the fact that this game had more animatronics than most other entries on this list. So we want a large cast of animatronics, especially one that forces the player to think quickly and act on various different gameplay mechanics. That's technically two points, but it's Five Nights at Freddy's 2, so I'll allow it. Five Nights at Freddy's 3. I am going to be brutally honest. I hated this game. It was impossible to find Springtrap because he was hidden too well in the cameras, so it felt more like a skewed game of Where's Waldo that pissed me off for the two weeks I tried to play it. These games are at their best when you can actually have fun playing them, so this is probably one of the worst games in my opinion. If you disagree, that's totally valid, but... Ugh... 
I'm never playing this game again. It looked dirty and grimy, not dark and scary. I can't really think of much that this game did better than the rest, other than lore revealed in the endings, so... I'm just going to skip this entry and move on. We already have three points anyway due to the last game on the list. Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Holy shit, I'm getting tired of saying these titles. This game was almost as frustrating as the third game, but it was overall much better at implementing new mechanics and survival strategies you could adapt each night. My personal favorite parts were the minigame sections, both the 2D RPG style segments and the 3D fun with plush trap levels. It added more fun to an otherwise very, very stressful game, so I think that minigames is definitely a good item to add to our list. Sister Location. This game is another one that's regarded very well by the community, and it's one of my favorite games too, so I don't blame anyone for that. This is the first game in the series where you can move between more than one setting throughout the night, where you would normally be trapped in a single room in previous games. This game's strength was giving us some freedom to move, but not enough to remove the sense of claustrophobia and danger. FNAF is at its best when you're isolated in a small space, unable to escape nearby threats and feeling helplessly trapped. So it's not exactly free roaming gameplay, it's more like limited roaming gameplay. That sounds right. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Simulator. The strength of this game is, well, just like previous entries I've already mentioned, mini games and variety of gameplay mechanics. We already have those on the list, so I'll just use this time slot to say that the Afton Family storyline should have ended here, and I'm kind of pissed off that it didn't. So... No more Afton family in this new game. None of that. Help Wanted. This VR game was a combination of remakes from previous games and new minigame segments made with existing characters. So, uh... I am once again going to use this segment to say that William Afton should be dead by now. Special Delivery. This is just a mobile game made as filler between the actual game releases. Moving on. And now, what you've all been waiting for... Security Breach. I like the fun characters, I like the different areas you can explore, and I think the game's best part is the daycare, which is at the very beginning of the goddamn game. Everything after the daycare level has close to zero tension whatsoever, and the free roaming map is so huge that it makes it impossible for there to be any feeling of claustrophobia whatsoever. In fact, literally nothing about this game is scary. This was clearly due to the shift in demographic for the franchise's fanbase, but it still kind of sucks that this game is supposed to be the finale of a beloved horror series. If I had to pick something from this game, it would be the storyline. This is the only game in the series to have a main storyline that the player follows throughout the night. There are still hidden secrets and lore to find, but I actually do like having something to latch onto in the game other than don't die, don't die, holy shit, don't die, so that's kinda nice. I'll add that to the list. As for the spin-off games, I'll briefly go through those now, even though they're not canon. FNAF World, no. Ultimate Custom Night, I liked the characters having different voice lines, so I'll add that to the list. That part was cool. Freddy in Space 2, no. Security Breach Fury's Rages. Also no. And now we're done with the spinoffs. So now that we've gone through all of the existing Five Nights at Freddy's games, let's review our list of bullet points to see what we want to see in the new game we're making for the franchise. This is obviously a fake game, by the way. I haven't made games since my freshman year of high school, and those games I made were... not of the best quality. Unless a game designer busts my door down, I literally can't make this into a real game. With that being said, let's take a look at what we would want to include in our fake FNAF game. Number one, hidden lore and secrets for the player to find. Number two, a large cast of animatronics. Number three, a wide variety of different gameplay mechanics. Number four, mini games or levels. Number five, limited roaming gameplay. Number six, no more Aftons, especially William. Number seven, a narrative storyline. And number eight, voice lines for the animatronics, because why not? Let's just add some spice. While we take these bullet points into consideration, we also have to make a game that can be realistically made with a standard budget and schedule. That means we can't have insanely crafted cinematics after every single scene, and we definitely can't make the game too big or too long because that would detract from the quality of this theoretical project. You all remember when Security Breach took on more than it could handle, yeah? Let's not repeat that mistake. And now, by compiling this list in my secret laboratory, 
I think that I have concocted a fantastic pitch for the next FNAF game. And that game is... Five Nights at Freddy's Welcome to Dream World. You play as a new staff member being hired to work at the newest Dream World Recreation Center, a large facility built with a whopping eight floors. However, only the first floor is above ground, which is where the lobby and entrance is located, along with other staff offices. All other seven levels of the building are underground, like a tall tower that was inverted to go down instead of up. This backfires when an unknown hacker unleashes dangerous malware into the building's technology, immediately leading to the facility shutting down on your third day at work. This malware is spread in the form of small virus chips that are placed on the various animatronics you will have to pass. The first two days were spent as tutorial sections where you become familiar with the different characters, gameplay elements, and storylines. The rest of the game will take place in five levels, hence the Five Nights aspect of the original franchise title. I want the game to replicate a good balance between the claustrophobia of the early FNAF games, where you're stuck in one room, and the later games where you can move to explore the building. Because of this, you can never have the freedom to roam the entire facility at once, that would be way too much space. Instead, there will always be some sort of obstacle that prevents you from leaving the level you're currently trapped in. Each level will be a different night that you're stuck in the underground facility, where you move from one floor of the building to the next. Your goal is to slowly make your way back to the first floor and escape. I imagine that the setup is similar to Portal 2, where you have to overcome various obstacles and levels with another character to guide you. Yet Welcome to Dream World would consist of different mini-games and events instead of puzzles. When you try to escape the building after it's shut down, you aren't alone. There are actually nine different animatronics that are all out to find you. Seven, if you count the triplets as a single antagonistic force, which I personally do because they're a collective menace to society. I want each animatronic to have a very distinct theme and personality. They are mascots, after all. They should be designed to stand out, and they have to appear as something that could be intended to entertain children as well. This means that we need robots with colorful, child-friendly designs, but we also need them to be scary in some form, so we don't ruin the horror aspects of the game. When I say this, I don't mean that the animatronics have to be broken, disoriented, or covered in dirt. <coughs> Security breach! Urgh. Instead, I want each animatronic to represent the traits associated with certain fears or phobias. I think that would be a much better way to make each animatronic unique, and it's also a better idea for potential horror scenarios in the game. For instance, imagine that you've fallen into the pool at the water park level, only to find that it's much deeper than you first expected. You fumble with your flashlight in the dark pool, but the murky waters around you suddenly begin to move. You can see something causing the movement, something big, but it slips away into the darkness before you can figure out what it is. You're now trapped underwater with limited gear, limited air, and something large slowly stalking you throughout each tunnel that connects the large pools. And when you finally do see what's been following you, it's a giant animatronic that towers over you. It has to be at least 20 feet tall, and it's staring at you from the bottom of the pool. I'd like to think that playing with some sub mechanophobia themes would make for a much more interesting jump scare than some random robot animal flailing its arms around in your face again. Because that's basically every jump scare in the entire series, let's be honest. Hello? Is someone there? I can hear you. Little copy, where have you gone? Why are you hiding from me? I only want to help you, little copy. Come out and play. Going back to the gameplay itself, the story would be divided between five nights, not including the first two levels that are used as tutorial and story setup. Like I mentioned earlier, there will be a character guiding the player throughout these levels, and that character is actually one of the animatronics. After the tutorial ends, you start the game by waking up on the 8th floor, in Star's broken theater that you fell into. Star is your most consistent ally, and he uses various railways attached to the ceiling of the facility to follow you around and guide you. He will help you uncover secrets and lore, but he will also help you figure out how to remove the virus chips and free the other animatronics. Rather than avoid or destroy the robots, in this game, you have to repair them. You are a hired mechanic, after all. This is your job. And that also means you have a reason to get up close and personal with these robots that want to snap you in half like a toothpick, so you can't just avoid them and hide the whole time like you could in Security Breach or any of the other games. You have to seek them out. So good luck not dying. Hello there, darling. Are you ready to witness the showstopper of a lifetime? 
Why, yes, of course I could help you. I know this facility like the back of my hand. Well, my hands are both different colors, so I suppose it depends on which perspective you'd like to focus on. But the back of my hand, nevertheless, one of them at least. Once you leave the theater, you will be immediately thrust into the seventh floor of the building, a colorful arcade that is home to three smaller robots, Masquerade, Melody, and Mimic. In this level, Star will guide the player through how to remove the virus chips that have been placed on each triplet while they race around the arcade. The player must keep up with the various mini-games being thrown their way while also searching for the chips on each robot's body. If a chip is left active for too long, the robot will attack the player. In this game, because I'm not a masochist and would like to enjoy my own game, the player will have three lives instead of one. These lives can be regained in between levels with currency or something? I don't know man, this is basically a FNAF fan fiction. Your hiding spot for this level is a security office that monitors over the arcade, and this is where you will play games through the cameras and search for ways to remove the three virus chips with Star. Unfortunately, Star also has a virus chip of his own, but you can't figure out where it is because even Star doesn't seem to know. When you befriend the animatronic, you quickly learn that each of his two theater masks have a different personality and AI. Scarlet, the orange teardrop mask, is triggered whenever Star becomes sad enough to cry or overreact in a dramatic fashion. Star uses this mask a lot, especially when you offend or insult him, but he never uses Bluey, the teal mask with a heart symbol. When Star finally does use this mask, it suddenly corrupts him and reveals that the virus chip was hidden inside of the Bluey mask. In order to remove the chip, you must figure out a way to make Star sad enough to cry and use the Scarlet Mask, which would force the Bluey Mask off his face because he can only use one at a time. You will have to dodge pieces of debris that are thrown your way and hide when the robot comes to attack you in the sound booth, which is your hiding spot for the level. Once Star is freed, he continues as your main ally and guide throughout the game, but it should be noted that every animatronic you help will also become an ally that helps you in future levels. This is partly because the levels get progressively more difficult and you kind of need some kind of help in the later ones. You will be able to call these animatronics to help you with a definitely not stolen walkie-talkie that Star gives you. Ah, uh, hmm. Let's leave the acting to the professionals, all right? Oh, you little brat! How dare you insult my masterpiece! Stop saying such horrible things and let me crush you! You are making a scene! Next, you will have to escape a maze to reach the haunted house attraction, which is where you discover what previously unseen robot has been chasing you throughout the maze. The animatronic reveals itself, and it is a two-headed machine named Lollipop. They run the haunted house attraction and maze together, a sort of all-year Halloween theme with candy and spooky decor. However, you discover that only one of the robot's two heads has been infected by the virus chip. Lolly is normal, but Pop has become feral and violent. Lolly frantically tries to reason with her brother and slow them down while you run around the haunted house to find something to use to restrain their shared body. You can remove the virus chip from Pop's side once the animatronic's body is restrained, but it's actually very hard to find all the tools required for your trap in the haunted house, especially since you have to run and hide from the rampaging lollipop at the same time. Are you lost? How did you get down here? You're never going to escape. You're never going to leave. Ignore him. He's been cranky all night. I heard something. Someone is here. No, nope, there's nobody here. Just the two of us. The maze, it moved. Why don't you believe me? I'm choosing to put my faith into someone else at the moment. There are a few other parts of this game's story that I'm skipping past right now, but that's just because I wanted to present some of my favorite ideas in this video, and I didn't really know what to include. I'm going to highlight another one of my favorite ideas here though, just as a final bit before we move on. In a later level of the game, you have to navigate a trampoline park and a playground obstacle course to escape Ribbon Dancer, an animatronic who declares you'll play a game of tag. This robot in particular is much creepier and scarier than all of the others you've encountered, so you assume that the virus has affected this character the most because he's an absolute psychopath. You eventually hide on a higher platform of the park, near the zipline station, and use cameras to keep track of Ribbon Dancer's location while you turn the lights on in the park. Ribbon Dancer can't see in bright lights, so you will have to trap him in place by making the attraction too bright. 
This works, but when you finally corner the animatronic, you discover that Riven Dancer never had a virus chip. He wasn't hacked, he's just always like this. When you are reunited with Star and your other allies, they all confirm this. You have now wasted an hour of the night. Good job. A new friend, Serendipity. This is going to be so much fun, fun, fun! One or two. Good and sin. I hear the bones under your skin. Let's play another game. Yes, yes, yes! This one is called Try Not to Die When I Throw You Off the Edge of This Cliff. It's my favorite part. I obviously didn't cover everything. I just kind of speed ran through all of those ideas instead of explaining them in a more organized manner. But that's basically the point of this video, so that's fine. The other animatronics would include Cheer, a racing animatronic who runs a roller rink attraction, Glory, the submerged pool animatronic that I mentioned earlier, and Rex, a very dangerous security robot who was built to get rid of intruders. Kinda like what you're doing right now, so you better stop sneaking around before he snaps you in half. Side fact, Glory and Rex are totally in love. This is my fake game, I can do whatever I want. As for the actual lore of this game, like the spooky stuff that isn't related to the main gameplay at all, oh man, I wrote an entire fucking soap opera. I don't have time to explain all of it now, but I'll go through a few bullet points of information in this section of the video. The company was founded by three people, but one of them went insane after some traumatic events in their childhood, so they became a serial killer in secret. When the company was opened, they swore to leave their criminal past behind, but eventually had a relapse and began to kill again, starting with one of their business partners. After one of them died, the remaining two founders eventually reached a stalemate where they argued over how the company should be managed and what the animatronics should be used for. A few other murders happen, and this results in the animatronics being possessed. When the killer discovers this, they decide to study the paranormal and work to achieve immortality, knowing they'll never get salvation and death because of their heinous crimes committed over the years. Star specifically seems to be possessed by the spirit of the founder who was killed, and the other robots are all haunted by the other victim's spirits. This is a FNAF game, of course the robots are fucking haunted. Why wouldn't they be? Also, there are other human employees trapped in the building with you. Sometimes you have to communicate with them or work together because all of you want to escape the building alive. You were hired as a mechanic, but you also meet a security guard, another technician, and a janitor. Those three humans are your co-workers, and they're also your allies throughout the game, but they normally don't appear at the same time as Star. All of your allies throughout the game will meet and collaborate in the later levels of the game, but until then, uh, you have two separate storylines unfolding during your gameplay. One with Star and the friendly animatronics you cured, and the other with the three human co-workers you navigate the building with over communicator chats. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Rainbot, why did you make this video? What's the point behind it? What is all of this leading up to? What are you trying to tell us? I honestly have no fucking clue. I just got a cool idea for a fake Five Nights at Freddy's inspired game, so I wanted to talk about it and see if anyone else liked the concept, but I feel bad leaving you guys on this cliffhanger because now you have a lot of the storyline left in the air and you don't know the full gameplay outline either. So I'll leave you with two notes about this idea before I vanish into the shadow realm, which is where all streamers go when we aren't making content. Note number one, if this video does really well, I'll make a follow-up video about Welcome to Dream World. I'd be more than happy to walk you guys through the entire game's story, go into more detail about each character, or even just gush about some cool horror concepts that would be featured in the game. Maybe I'd even make a song about each character? Fan songs have been a huge part of the FNAF community after all, so it would only make sense for this new game to get some music of its own. This brings me to the final part of the video with note number two. In my ideal Five Nights at Freddy's game, I would include at least one original song. Something short and simple. I really don't care what it is, but with how big of an impact that fan music has had on the growth of the franchise, it would be a huge missed opportunity to not have one of the animatronics sing an official song in one of the levels or cutscenes. Think of it like the GLaDOS song from the Portal games. It would be a neat touch. With that being said, I'm a massive nerd, and I just forced you to listen to me talk about my Five Nights at Freddy's OCs for like half an hour. Later, nerds. I'll see you in the next live stream. Peace out.